Please open your Bibles to um, John, the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses uh, one, and, one and two. Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. When Lise and I and the kids lived in Montreal, I had a raspberry patch in my backyard whose stalks were two, two, to four feet, uh, two to four feet high. And uh, we'd eat sweet, delicious raspberries in the summer. I had so many, you know, I had to kind of put them in baggies and give them to people. We had so many raspberries, just, just a wonderful, wonderful thing. And uh, when, I, when I went online to get information on how to care for these, I was told that I, that I had to kind of cut the stalks down to the ground level so that they would grow again the following, the following year. And to me, I, I'm not a gardener person, you know, I, I, don't, I don't garden. Uh, so to me, this sounded so counterintuitive. You know, my Italian nature, I wanted to feed it. You know, I wanted to feed it and give it water and do all kinds of stuff, you know, and fuss over it and just clip it a little bit here and there, you know, and no, 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 just cut that thing down to the ground, you know, and I, I, I did it, you know, reluctantly I did it. And sure enough, uh, the following season, you know, it would grow and it just grew bigger, more raspberries, it was, it was great. I think we know from experience that without pruning or cutting back, shrubs, trees, plants, whatever. Uh, some flowers, some plants would just not grow properly. And so in the passage that we read this morning, we see that this principle of pruning is also true as far as the church is considered. Jesus says that God is always at work pruning, so to speak, his church and he does so for a variety of reasons. And so this morning in my lesson, I want to give you uh, three reasons why God prunes his church. Reason number one, God prunes his church to get rid of the dead wood. Jesus says plainly, he cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. That's pretty plain. Branches that don't produce need to go because they're taking up space and nutrients needed by the, by the tree. Now in the church, the unproductive members are eventually cut away as well and need to be because they take up ministry resources and time and spiritual energy without producing anything in return. Oh, they may still be sitting on a pew from time to time, but once the Lord cuts them away, they're no longer attached to the tree. Now, there are various ways that the Lord does this. First of all, he either calls you to judgment in death. That's one way he prunes. This is a drastic method, but uh, your empty and unproductive Christian life simply comes to an end suddenly in death. Like the man in Jesus' parable who wanted to build you know, bigger barns or the one who ignored the pleadings of the beggar at his doorstep in Luke chapter 12 and 16. What happened to them? Well, they were spiritually unfruitful despite their earthly blessings and God just cut them away from physical life and sent them on to death in order to await judgment. That's one way he prunes. Or God lets you cut yourself away like the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. That's one method. He lets you do it to yourself. You know, in this parable, the younger son cut himself away from the father and the father let him go. Of course, we know that he eventually came back in repentance, but in real life, not everybody comes back. Demas, for example, a Bible character, uh, is a good example of a real life example of, of this person cutting themselves away uh, from the church. In the epistle to Philemon in verse 23, Paul refers to Demas, 
along with Luke and others as his co-workers. And then in Colossians chapter four, verses seven to 14, Paul sends greetings on behalf of many people describing some service or some spiritual trait that each one of these exhibited. You know, a beloved brother, a faithful helper, a coworker, a servant in the Lord. He gives each one a kind of a prefix you know, to, his, to his service, to his value. And in verse 14, he ends the passage by simply referring to Demas in the following uh, way. He says, Luke, the beloved physician, see that's who Luke is, the beloved physician, sends you his greetings and also Demas, period. Nothing to describe Demas. Demas was with Paul, but he was no longer serving, not very active, not very fruitful. And so in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, Paul finally reports that Demas has gone. He explains it this way. He says, for Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessal uh, uh, Thessalonica. And so Demas was fruitful, yes, and then less and less and less so until he just cut himself away by his desire to return to the world. You know, Paul had many effective and fruitful co-workers in Tychicus, uh, Onesimus, uh, Aristarchus, Mark, Justice, Epaphras, and Luke, to name just a few. Demas was one of these for a time, but when he ceased to produce and yearned to return to the world, Paul and God let him go. Sometimes people just cut themselves away from the tree. Uh, God also, uh, prunes the tree in order to remove the harmful growth. You know, sometimes the tree contracts a disease and certain branches are infected. In these instances, you, you have to remove the infected branches in order to save the rest of the, of the tree. Some people in the church cause trouble and they threaten its reputation or its stability or its spiritual health. When this happens, God will clear away the sick parts to guarantee the life of the healthy part. Again, how does God do this exactly? Well, sometimes through death. You know, in Acts chapter five, there's the story of a couple who lied about their offering and they were struck dead immediately. It makes you be careful what you write on that white card there. You, know, you may not make it out alive, just teasing. The danger, of course, was uh, that a couple of people who wanted to be leaders, they wanted to be examples in the church, and they thought that they could do this by lying to God himself. Imagine, <laughs> imagine how dangerous would it be if corrupt people like this had found their way into the leadership of the early church. Of course, death is not the only or the usual way that God prunes the church of poisonous fruit, although we are eventually all removed from the church building in this way. God has given the church another way to prune itself of divisive, immoral, lazy, and false brethren, and this is the method of discipline. Just as families use discipline to correct disobedient children, the church has to resort to this as well when members cause trouble or they bring shame on the body and thus threaten harm to the Lord's church. There are many forms of church discipline described in the Bible and they're given for various types of uh, problems. For example, disputes between two people. Uh, Jesus talks about this in Matthew 18, you know, where he says, uh, go to your brother, if your brother sins against you, go to your brother, you know, one on one. That's one way of settling a kind of a dispute. And then there are people who cause division in the church and there's a whole other approach to that. Uh, Paul describes in Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Uh, those who are guilty of gross public immorality, uh, Paul gives instructions in 1 Corinthians chapter five in how to deal with those people. And, and then those who are trapped in sin, 
personal sin that is destroying their faith. Again, Paul describes the approach in Galatians 6 that one can use uh, to help those people. Now the approach is different in each situation, but the objective is always the same, uh, to make the person aware that they are in trouble or they're causing trouble, or to try to help that person correct the problem and, and deal with it. And then to separate people who are causing trouble from the church, to prune them away if they continue that sinful behavior. You know, we had to do this uh, disciplining action several times when I was in Montreal, for example. And it was always painful, but it was necessary. I remember a time there was a, a retired minister who continually caused division and turmoil in the church in Verdun. He had retired and he had you know, kind of placed membership with our congregation in, in Verdun. And, after a time, there, you know, there started to be trouble, just trouble, arguments and divisions and stuff going on. And we wonder what is going on here? And eventually we found out that he was the one causing and whispering this and you know, he disagreed with this and he was forming a posse over here to agree with what he was thinking. You know, he was just causing trouble. And so we, we went to him and we warned him several times. And, uh, uh, and, and told them that we would refuse to have fellowship with him if he didn't just behave himself and stop causing this type of turmoil in the church. Well, after we did this, he left. And guess what? No more trouble. No more trouble, peace and quiet. Everybody was getting along. Now, other churches where he went refused to discipline him and he caused division uh, in those places. As a matter of fact, the congregation that he was last with eventually split in two. But when we disciplined or pruned him away, we inoculated ourselves against further illness and trouble. It's not easy to do and it's painful, but sometimes it's necessary. There was a, another brother, uh, this time in Villamard, uh, that congregation, who committed financial fraud against several members in the church. They came to Roger and I, Roger was the other minister. They came to us and, and talked about the amount of money that they lost. And you know, the most vulnerable, vulnerable people, widows, people who didn't have much understanding about financial matters, people with not a lot of education, uh, you know, uh, pensioners, things like that. Uh, this, this brother was, had a kind of a Ponzi scheme going. In other words, he was selling shares to fake companies and he was using you know, the money that he'd get to one guy, he'd pay a few dividends to another guy and he kept the money for himself. And, you know, and he just kept turning this thing over and over. And finally we confronted him and we asked him to repent. You know, we had him dead to rights with all the, you know, all the paperwork and everything. There were no companies, there were no investments. He was running a scheme. And we said, look, we'll help you. We'll, we'll gather the people that you've defrauded. You know, we, we won't go to the police. We'll, you know, we'll settle it among ourselves. You can kind of pay back. You know, well, let's, let's save your soul and let's try to help the people that you cheated and let's keep it in house and let's you know, do the right thing. And he refused. And so we had to uh, disfellowship him. We withdrew fellowship from him and no one else was cheated. And the damage to the church uh, was repaired in this way, at least further damage uh, was. And we reported him. Uh, the, we, the, the members asked us, what should we do? Well, there was a crime. The person refuses to repent. And, and then they went on and reported him to the financial institutions, so on and so forth. The point here is that pruning the dead wood and the infected branches is never easy or pleasant, but it's necessary at times for the health and the growth of the church. The Lord knows and teaches this, but this is a lesson that we often are reluctant to learn. And then finally, God prunes the healthy branches in order to make them stronger. As Jesus said in John 15, He prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. Pruning the good part of the plant in the fall is what prepares it for growth and fruitfulness in the spring, even though it's not evident. 
You know, when I cut my lush and leafy four foot raspberry stalks down to the ground level, there wasn't much to indicate that they would come back, but they did and they were stronger and with a better harvest the following year. The same principle works with Christians in the church, with individual Christians in the church. God prunes us back in various ways to strengthen and to make us more fruitful. And he does this in a variety of ways. Again, for example, sometimes he allows us to suffer illness or disappointments or injustice and various trials in order to test the quality of our faith. Going through these things without giving up our faith and our hope actually increases the quality of our faith, which in turn enables us to experience joy and peace and true hope. You can't have these things without great faith and great faith is cultivated through God's work in pruning us through trial. Sometimes he prunes us by making us wait. Personally, that's the worst for me. I don't know about you. I'd rather be sick and the doctors say, well, you know, you'll be in bed or the surgery will you know, put you out of commission for a week or two and then in about a month, you know, your arm will be better and you'll be back to normal. I'd rather have that. I'd rather have that situation than when God just makes me wait. I got to wait. And he's the only one who knows how long I've got to wait. Sometimes, he removes our strength. Sometimes he, he inhibits our talent. In other words, we're not able to exercise our talent for some reason or other. Sometimes he reduces our wealth and all of these things so that we will depend more on him than on ourselves. You know, I, 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 I did this with my plants in the spring. I would tie the growing stalks to uh, sticks in the ground, you know, guides to help them. And it seemed to restrict them as they grew. They, they, they couldn't just grow wild in any direction as raspberry plants seemed to do. They were tied firmly to the sticks which were driven into the ground. But in the fall, when the raspberries came, the fruit was so heavy that the stalks would have broken if they wouldn't be supported by the stick or the fruit would have been on the ground, eaten by the insects. Well, there are several stalks that would have not survived had I not you know, propped them up with uh, sticks. Well, in the same way, God restricts us. He, he holds us back. He puts limits on us in some way in order to make sure that we can handle the harvest that He has planned for us to bear. He did this with the apostle Paul. He prevented him from going to Asia. He put a thorn in his flesh. And yet Paul was instrumental in planting many churches in the Roman Empire and writing a good portion of the New Testament. I wonder what he thought as he sat in a dungeon. You know, we say he was in prison. Well, it was a dungeon. It was a damp dungeon basement chained to a pole. I wonder what he thought about his career. I wonder what he thought about his mission to bring the gospel to the whole world. He was a key guy, he was important. He was the one planting the churches. He was a one man you know, apostolic church planting machine. We don't hear about the other apostles, but Paul we hear about. Even in histories, non-religious histories of various countries in those parts of the world talk about this a historical figure, Paul the Apostle. I wonder what he said to God when they pronounced him guilty and put him in jail and weeks turned into months and months turned into years. No preaching, no debating, no uh, uh, you know, uh, giving the gospel to people that that hadn't heard it before. I wonder what he thought. Do you think at any time during those moments he spent in jail, he wasn't thinking, Lord, what are you doing? I'm your guy. I'm a Roman citizen. I'm the guy that can go all around the Roman Empire. I have freedom of movement that even the other apostles who are Jews don't have. 
What are you thinking leaving me here? I'm restricted. I can't use the talent that you've given me. I mean, you know. It's hard to acknowledge in those moments that God knows what he's doing. Very hard. And then of course, at other times, God will not only prune us back, but he'll use us to start another vine. Just as I transplanted healthy branches from one stalk in order to begin a new plant. This is how the church grew and spread in the beginning. It was well established in Jerusalem, but then God pruned the church through a persecution in that area by uh, Jewish leaders. Luke says that this severe persecution didn't destroy the church, it served to spread it to other places. We read in Acts, he says, therefore those who had been scattered because of the persecution went about preaching the word. And so God taking healthy branches in Jerusalem and replanting them in other places. You see, the thing about pruning is that it is inevitable. You cannot avoid it. God is always pruning. Through good times or bad times, God is always pruning the church. And when he says, when I'm saying God is pruning the church, I don't mean you know, he prunes it like the whole group. He's pruning the church one member at a time. But it's always happening. It's always going on. So the question is not, will I ever be pruned? The question is, what should I do when I am being pruned? Because believe me, everybody is pruned. All the disciples are pruned. So when it's happening to you, when you're being pruned, a couple of things uh, to uh, remember. If you're being pruned because you're unproductive, repent. <laughs> if you're being pruned because you're not productive, repent. God can always take you in death, but in the meantime, you can change. Pray and ask God to help you identify your talents or ask Him for an opportunity to use them or to use more of them. You'll know that He's answering your prayers because you will see the fruit of your service in your life. Then if you're being pruned because you are diseased, repent. <laughs> you see a pattern happening here? Repent. Your situation is more urgent because there is a greater danger to you and the church. Unfruitful branches often linger for a long time before they're pruned away. Theirs is the slow death of spiritual laziness and neglect. But the diseased branch is evident and often rewarded quickly, excuse me, removed quickly and painfully. The good news is that when a diseased branch is healed, it usually produces a great harvest of gratitude in the future. How many times have I heard brothers and sisters say, you know, I was going the wrong way and this happened and it kind of woke me up a little bit and I turned things around and I began, oh, uh, uh, thank, thank you God. Thank you God for finding me, for you know, getting my attention, Lord, for kind of slapping me on the side of the head so I would understand what I was doing wrong. Thank you, Lord. And then of course, if you're being pruned because God wants more growth, well then rejoice, rejoice. Submit to God's work in you, no matter what form it takes, because in the end, you will be much healthier, much more fruitful, than before. As the Hebrew writer says, for they disciplined us, meaning our fathers, our human fathers, for they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he, meaning God, disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. James summarizes this process when he says the following, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. You could put there various prunings, same thing. 
knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect result, its complete, its whole, its mature result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And so let's remember that we all have been, are being, or will be pruned by the Lord. The only difference is why he's doing it and how we react to it. And my prayer as I close out this morning is that we are among those who are being cultivated for a future harvest and not being cut away because of laziness or disease. If anyone is here this morning and realizes uh, that God is trying to get their attention and maybe they need to repent. Uh, maybe they need to confess Christ and obey the gospel which they have been putting off. Then we encourage you to come forward and, and make your needs known to the church as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement. Shall we do that now please?